Hello everyone. So in this recitation, we'll be talking about CTC decoding and beam search. So let's look into what the problem is uh, that we are, are trying to tackle. So here we are working on sequence to sequence modeling. So in this task, we'll be given an input sequence X of say length N, and we are required to produce an output sequence say Y of length M. So one thing to note here is that the length of our input sequence and output sequence might not be same. So this is something that you'd be working on in homework 3P2. So sequence to sequence with order synchrony. What order synchrony means here is that uh, for our output, we would know that uh, what particular symbols occur and what would be the order of those particular symbols in the output. So say uh, if our output is supposed to be the word bat, we know that our output is going to contain the uh, symbols corresponding to b, a, and t, right? And we would know what order in which uh, they would occur, but we would not know uh, at what time steps do we need to output those particular symbol. So we know the order synchrony, but we do not have the timing information. Going back to our homework 1P2 problem that we worked on, which is phoneme recognition, we basically uh, worked on it as a sequence classification task where you were given a, a set of inputs and you want we, we worked on uh, determining what the phoneme would be at any given time step t. So can we work on that particular problem statement using uh, recurrent neural nets? So the answer is yes. So if you see the diagram here on the left, first going over what each block here means. So here the green blocks essentially represent our recurrent uh, neural network architecture. The red blocks represent our input and the blue block represents our output. So for our homework 1P2 problem, what we could do is just feed in our input sequence to our recurrent uh, RNN um, model. And uh, the, out the last output that is produced by our RNN model can be considered as uh, our phoneme prediction output. So how can we use this uh, uh, learnings from homework 1P2 and extend it to solve our homework 3P2 problem? So uh, the problem that we are solve trying to solve now, the network architecture for that would look something like uh, the diagram on right side. So here the, we have an input sequence and what we see here is we want to produce output sequence, right? So we are trying to work on a little more complex problem here, which involves uh, us providing a sequence of inputs to the model. And we want to asynchronously output a sequence of output symbols. So if you see here, we are asynchronously outputting the uh, output symbols B, I, F, I, uh, from our RNN model, right? So one thing uh, to note here is that we have not represented the outputs produced by these particular blocks. Uh, so at t equals to one, two, and four, and so on, we have not uh, represented any outputs that are produced by the blocks, right? So the question here is, uh, in the previous diagram, we ignored the outputs produced by intermediate time steps, but can we use it? can we use the output produced by those blocks as well? So the answer is yes. So we can exploit these particular outputs as well and assume that the output produced by uh, time steps, uh, which, uh, which are proceeding to the time steps at which we are sampling the outputs are same as the output uh, that uh, output at time t. So to make that clear, we can assume that output produced by time step t equals to one and at t equals to two, which is these two blocks, is same as the output produced by this particular block, which is B. So we can say that the output here is B, 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 right? And so on. Okay, so uh, we know uh, how would we work with producing the outputs, but the next question uh, which comes to our mind is that, how do we know when to output the symbols, right? So how do we know that at this, particular t equals to three, we need to output a symbol b and not at t equals to four, right? How do we choose that? When do we odd output these particular symbols? So let's try to apply some of the ideas that we use in homework 1p2. So what we did in homework 1p2 is that at each particular time step, our network 
outputs a probability for each output symbol given all the inputs uh, till that particular time, right? So we can apply the same idea here. So what we can say is that taking, ex taking an example of time step three, which is this particular block, we can say that uh, our network produces a output probability of all the particular symbols uh, in the output vocabulary given all the inputs till this particular time step t. So uh, given x0, x1, and x2, at this particular time step, my network will produce an output vector which would have the probability of each particular output symbol which occurs as part of our output vocabulary. Cool. So now we would at so saying that at each particular time step we'll have a output probably probability vector uh, for each of the output symbols that uh, that our output vocabulary consists of, right? But even using that, how would we uh, know that what our output symbol sequence should uh, look like given all the inputs, right? So one thing that we could do is that simply uh, take the most probable symbol at each particular time uh, for each particular time and merge all the symbols that are uh, repeating. So this would be clear if, uh, if we look into an example uh, going forward. So So if we look at uh, this particular example here, right? So uh, at, at time step, say t equals to one, which corresponds to our input x equals to zero, our network produces a probability vector, uh, pro probability vector, which basically has the probability for each symbol, each output symbol, right? So what we could, what that first statement uh, means that using this probability vector, we could just pick the output symbol with the highest probability and we could do that for each particular time step. And if we see that at two given time steps, if our output produced, output symbol produced is same, we could just merge those two, right? So if say um, it at time step t we produced a burr, at time step uh, at t equals to one we produced a burr and at time step t equals to two we produced again a uh, output symbol b, right? We could just merge both of those. Right, so that's what that's what it means. Right, so but what is the problem with this uh, solution? The issue is that this might not always represent the most probable uh, probable sequence of symbols. Also, for words like hello, H E L L O, where the letter L occurs two times, if we try to merge um, this, um, if we try to merge the symbols at um, certain time steps, we would not be able to produce a output like H E L L O, and we might end up merging, and we might be producing H E L O, which is not the right output, right? So we would essentially the issue is that we cannot distinguish between an extended symbol. Here, extended symbol means um, uh, we would not be able to work with repetition of a given symbol, right? So, uh, what is the next solution? What we could do is impose some external constraints, and uh, using these constraints, we would we would be probably outputting a better symbol sequence than just uh, using our solution one. Right. So combining both of the previous solutions, what we can come up with is something like this. So here in this diagram, we see that at each time step, we are outputting a, a probability vector with. Uh, the probability of all the particular symbols occurring in our output uh, vocabulary. Uh, and what we could do is that uh, since we know that our output should contain only particular symbols, we can, um, we can just mask out the probability which our network produces for all the other symbols. So if say our output is BIFI, BIFI, right? So we do not see that our uh, output contains a h or d or e h so we could just mask out these rows a h d e h and g so we could block out all the rows that do not include any symbols in the target sequence and we could compose a graph that includes only these particular symbols in our output sequence so by that what i mean is that we could have something like this b 
uh, I, F, I. So at each particular time step, we are only concerned about the symbols that might actually occur in our output sequence. And then we uh, disregard all the other symbols which, which are not power, part of our output sequence. Also, one another thing to note here is that we have uh, repeated the output probability for this particular symbol IY. So if we are um, working on, yeah, so if we see here, we would have like a probability vector of this kind. So if we say that at, uh, so we say, if we, if we know that IY occurs two times, and this is the ordering, for convenience, we have um, replicated this IY row two times in our output and we create a graph of this particular kind. So now our problem reduces uh, to the following, right? So we know that our output symbol contains of these particular symbols B, I, F, I. We also know that it starts with B and it ends with I, Y, right? So starting at B and ending at I, Y, we need to basically uh, get a, se a sequence from one of these um, sequences marked here, right? So what we want to do is find the most probable sequence from using all the sequences that might occur, that might be possible using B as the starting symbol and IY as the ending symbol. So since we know that the symbol, uh, starting symbol should be B, so the probability of B should be one here. And since we know um, that IY should be our ending symbol, so probability of IY in this particular vector should be one again, right? So in the lecture, professor has discussed about uh, the forward backward algorithm and uh, which, would, which would be helpful in computing the most probable sequence using this particular graph, right? So this particular graph essentially says that uh, from at every time step uh, T, we have the option of either staying at the, at the same symbol or moving to the next symbol and same applies to each time step. So again, at time step t equals to two, we could stay at the same symbol or go to the next symbol, right? And we should uh, select uh, the most probable sequence uh, using all the particular sequences available to us. So, but what are the issues, right? So as we saw earlier, uh, if, if we have a word, say R-O-O-D, right? And if our um, network produces output of this particular kind, R, 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 and multiple times O and a D. And if we uh, stick to our idea of just merging all the similar symbols produced by certain time steps, so just merging these three R's to one and all these O's to one O and D, what would our uh, decoded output look like? We would just end up uh, getting an output of R, O, D. But actually, the output symbol that we were looking for was ROOD. So how do we solve this problem of repetition of certain symbols in the output? For that, we introduce an explicit extra symbol, uh, which is called the blank symbol. And we add that, uh, we add that between, between particular symbols um, as follows. So, so if you see here, we have RRR and then we have a uh, blank and then O, then blank, then multiple Ds. And uh, how we combine this particular thing was uh, we just merge, merged all the, all the repetition of characters between uh, any two given blanks. So we merged all this O into one O. Now look at this particular example. We have RR and then a blank and then R and then blanks and then O and then blanks and then D, right? So if we try to uh, compare here between two blanks, if there are repetitions, we would just merge. So uh, both of these R are merged to single R. This R remains as it is, right? These two O that occur between blank symbols are merged. And then this D remains as it is. And then these two Ds are merged to single D. Right. So we see here is what we see here is that introduction of a blank symbol, uh, extra symbol, serves the purpose of uh, solving the issue of repetition of symbols in our output. Right. So what we 
want is a graph uh, like this. So what we have done here is uh, introduced blank symbols as our start symbol and end, end symbol. And we have also added blank symbols uh, between uh, each of the symbols that might occur in our output. So how do we read this particular graph, right? So similar as before, at each particular uh, point in the graph, we would have an option to stay, option of staying at the same symbol or moving forward to the next symbol, right? So at this particular point, we could stay at the symbol blank or we could move to the next symbol, which is B, right? So from blank, we can either stay at the same symbol blank or we could move to the next symbol B. Now look, uh, now we look at what happens for any particular character like B, right? So for, for the symbol B, if we see here, we have the option of staying at the sim symbol B, moving to the next symbol, which might be blank or moving to the next symbol, which might be IY, right? So what we see here is that we have uh, represented an arrow which skips this blank symbol because if the character, if the symbols that we have in the output are different, then we essentially do not have any use case of using this symbol because it's it's just an extra symbol. It doesn't, it is not required because we anyways know that these, these are not the same symbols, right? But uh, let's look into the next example, which is the case where we have repetition IY and IY. So if we see here, this particular block I, I where we have the probability of IY, we see here we have an arrow which points to IY, which is stay at the same symbol IY or an arrow which says that move to the next symbol, which is blank. So as in case with B, where we had three arrows of staying to the same symbol B, moving to the next blank or moving to IY, we see, we see that this particular uh, skip connection that we have, skip uh, arrow that we have here is missing in this particular case. So we cannot directly uh, have an arrow or we cannot just travel uh, traverse our graph such that we uh, go from this particular um, point in the graph to this particular point in the graph, skipping the skipping the blank symbol. And the reason being, since the symbols are repeating, IY and IY are repeating, we want we want to have a blank symbol with which gives us a separation between two 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 same symbols, and then uh, that would help us uh, uh, maintain the repetition of symbols. So. Uh, so what would our final uh, training procedure for CTC look like, right? So we would want to have a network which is set up, right? Uh, any any kind of RNN uh, model that we want to set up. We want to initialize our model with a blank symbol, pass the training instances through our network and obtain the probabilities for all symbols that are part of our output vocabulary at each time step, right? As we discuss here, we want to get uh, we want to get the output probability of each uh, symbol in our vocabulary for each time step, right? Similar to this particular uh, block here. We want to construct a graph, which is similar to the one which is on the previous page, essentially block out all the symbols that do not occur in our output sequence. So out of, out of this particular graph where we have the output probabilities of all the particular symbols, we want to block out the ones which are not in our output se uh, sequence uh, and construct a graph of this particular kind. Run the forward backward algorithm, which is discussed in the lecture, compute the divergence between the output that we would, dec uh, we that we would produce and the actual output and uh, update our network parameters. So this is a gist of the CTC training procedure. And now uh, Ameya will take us through um, the CTC uh, decoding part at, uh, at the inference time. Hello, everyone. I'm Ameya, and I'll be talking about CTC decoding, which is how CTC operates during inference time. So we saw in the earlier parts of this recitation how uh, CTC operates during training, how it solves the problem of alignment by considering all possible alignments during training. However, 
during inference we cannot consider all possible al alignments as we want to output one sequence and uh, to do this there are three main strategies vd search exhaustive search and beam search so let's talk about greedy search so greedy search is the simplest form of ctc decoding and it is very easy to implement as well for greedy search we just select the most probable vocabulary symbol at each time step and uh, th thus over the time steps this becomes our output sequence uh, although this is easy to implement it has a pitfall that selecting the most probable uh, vocab symbol at each time step might not lead to the actual highest probability path uh, you can call you can see this as greedy search being a bit short-sighted so the alternative to, to this might be exhaustive search so exhaustive search considers all possible paths that can be decoded and then selects the one with the highest score so although this guarantees decoding an optimal path or sequence uh, it has the disadvantage of being computationally very expensive since the computation is exponential in terms of our uh, vocab symbols and hence this is not a feasible option speaking practically um, so then we come to beam search this is sort of the middle ground between greedy search and exhaustive search in greedy search we consider just the most probable output at each time step instead in beam search we consider the top k paths this ensures that we are considering more than just the highest probable output at each, at each time step and by limiting our search to top k paths we are ensuring that uh, the computation is feasible unlike exhaustive search so uh, let's talk about an example so we saw this image earlier x is our input sequence to the rnn at time step 0 1 up to 8 and we have the probability distributions output by our rnn for uh, each symbol in our vocabulary in addition with the blank symbol for ctc so to understand this better let's reduce the scope and use some actual values so let's just consider a three time step sequence and a vocabulary of a and b with the addition of the blank symbol and at each time step we have a probability distribution over our uh, vocabulary and so if we are using greedy search uh, we would use uh, so at time step one we would select the most probable output output symbol which is blank at the next time step we would select a and after that we would select b so the uh, decoded output sequence would be blank a b and after reducing that is eliminating the blanks we would be left with a b and um, as you will see that a b is actually not the most probable output path but a b is our output with greedy search so let's see how beam search will deal, deal with the same problem so we have the same setup with an input of three time steps and the same probability distribution at each time step so sos here is just a start of sequence symbol this can just be considered as blank and um yeah so the beam width here is three so at each time step instead of considering the most probable output like greedy search we would consider the top three most probable output sequences so at time step one we have just three symbols in our vocabulary so we would choose all three and decide to expand on them and by expand i mean that at next time step we append all symbols from our vocabulary to the top k symbols that we selected or the top k sequences that we selected in the previous time step so for example we uh, we will concatenate blank to each of the previous characters so that will give us blank blank a blank b blank similar with a and similar with b uh, then we would perform the reduction step which is to eliminate uh, blank and repeating characters and then add the scores for uh, sequences that uh, decode to uh, decode to the same value so for example blank a and a a here according to the rules of ctc would both decode to a so 
the final score of the sequence A at, at this time step would be the addition of these two scores. Now, um, note that we are not decoding A blank to A here because A is not yet a trailing blank. We don't know what character will follow the sequence A blank. And um, it can be another A, it can be B, or it can be another blank. So in this case, we cannot say which character will follow. That's why we cannot uh, consider A blank to be A at this time step, similar with B blank. So now again, at this time step, we select the three most probable sequences. That is the three most, uh, that is the sequence, three sequences with the highest scores. And we consider them for the next time step. So they are blank A and BA. We repeat our process from the previous time step, which is to append the characters or symbols from our vocabulary. So again, blank, blank, blank A, blank B, and so on. And now again, we perform the reduction step. So here, as you can see, A blank will now be reduced to A because this is our final time step. So we know that no character will follow the trailing blank. And this is indeed the last character in the sequence. So this can be eliminated. So blank A, A blank, and A, A will all reduce to the same sequence, which is A. And the final score of the sequence A will be the addition of these three scores. So if you perform the addition, you will find out that A is actually the one with the highest score. And this will be our final output according to beam search. And um, yeah, so unlike greedy search where the decoded output turned out to be a b according to beam search it will be a and uh, we'll see uh, the computation shortly and you will see that a the sequence output sequence a actually does have a higher score than a b you can also do this with exhaustive search considering all possible paths and you will reach the same conclusion as the output sequence a but it will be much more computationally expensive so let's go to an example so we are again taking the same setup where our input data is of three time steps and the probability distributions over these time steps as shown. Uh, now, just for clarity, uh, I have written the output probabilities uh, row wise. However, the output of your model and the input to your decoding strategy would have a slightly different shape, which would be of number of symbols plus one, the plus one to account for the blank, sequence length, and batch size. So I'm just transpo transposing it accordingly. Now I have a very simple implementation of greedy and beam search using just NumPy. I won't be showing the code for this as you will be implementing this on your own in homework three part one. And uh, the pseudo code for this implementation will also be covered in very detail by professor in maybe two lectures and the pseudo code is very comprehensive it's actually just the code in a language like cc plus plus so just following that would should be enough for implementing greedy and beam search so uh, yeah we have an input of three time steps we have our symbol set which is a and b and uh, we will be adding a blank to this as well so our vocabulary set is actually a b blank we are using a beam width of three. That means that at each time step, you would be considering the three most probable output sequences for further expansion. So if we run greedy search, like we saw in our slides, we would get the output as AB and the score would actually be 0 0.125. And you can calculate this to see uh, the score. However, if we then go to beam search, we would we, we see that the actual highest probability output path output sequence is a and the score is 0 0.17 which is indeed higher than what we got by greedy search so this demonstrates how greedy search uh, how greedy search is not able to find certain higher probability paths because of its short-sighted nature so let's walk through what beam search does step by step so at time step one, we have our initial uh, initial paths, which are blank A and B. So if you notice that I'm, I will always be 
writing the blank symbol and the non blank symbols separately this is just to deal with the situation that we talked about earlier which was that uh, at each intermediate time step which is not the final time step we don't know whether the blank will be succeeded by another symbol or another blank so we cannot reduce it so it's just easier to consider these separately so at time step two unpruned paths just mean all of the paths decoded at the previous time step pruned paths means that we apply the beam width over the unpruned paths so we consider the top k out of all of the unpruned paths here the beam width is three and the output sequences at the previous time step were also three so we are just left with the same output sequences now we perform two steps on this extend with blank and extend with symbol so extend with blank means appending a blank to the previous sequence and uh, you don't see the blank here because it's just an empty string but uh, it actually this is blank blank this is a blank and this is b blank and extend with symbol means appending one of the non blank symbols in our vocabulary to the previous output sequences and uh, this includes the uh, and this includes repeating characters as well which will be reduced to which will be reduced according to our ctc rules so this here is actually aa reduced to a this is bb reduced to b and then we have ab and ba now at the next time step the unpruned paths are is it's basically the union of are paths extended with blanks and paths extended with symbols at the previous time step. We apply the pruning process, which is selecting the top k according to our beam width, which gives us these three uh, output sequences to work with. Now we again perform uh, extend with blank and extend with symbol on top of this, which gives us the which gives us the entire entire um, output sequences at the next time step. Uh, which would be the union of this set of extend with blank and this set of extend with symbol. And um, now, since this is our final time step, we would select the we would select the most probable sequence from this. And before that, we do a reduction. So, for example, you see that we have two scores for the sequence A. So these just can be combined with a summation, and that becomes the final score for A. And um, yeah so our final score for a would be 0 0.17 and this would be the most likely output path and this is what beam search would give you and this is uh, uh, this is a higher score that we obtained during using greedy search so um yeah that's how greedy search exhaustive search and beam search work and we saw it using a very simple uh, problem with actual values. Thank you.